We traveled to the far eastern edge of the large feline underground village, Ziza soon leading us to a tall and surprisingly well-constructed circular wooden door. Some sort of facial image of what appeared to be a proud feline had been carved into the door, its artistry not all that bad. Ziza stood aside, expecting me to open the door and step inside. About to open the door, I noticed that the facial image actually looked familiar. It took a few moments and then it hit me, the image looked like the feline Lord Rustinian who we met within the power tower earlier. It was probably just coincidence, but there was no mistaking the likeness. Stepping into the chamber beyond, it was initially difficult to see with all the orange incense floating about, the smoke emitted by two stone braziers softly burning to the north and south. A variety of weapons, armor, and shields stood in racks along all four walls, we had entered some sort of guard room or practice facility. Ziza nervously looked at me, then stepped further into the chamber and disappeared. Moments later, a tall humanoid approached from within the fog and we met the largest feline we had ever seen. Donning gleaming armor and decorated in colored cloth, the creature was quite impressive, a feline warrior I wouldn't have believed could be so tall and mighty. Worse, I was pretty sure the incense wafting about in here was actually a mild hallucinogenic poison, and that the longer we stood in it, the more difficult it would become to defend ourselves. Hence, we needed to escape the room as soon as we could. Outsiders, the feline champion began, addressing my entire party. To prove honor, you must defeat us. Win, and you see king. Lose, and we show you back to jail cell. Accept? Although the mighty feline himself seemed formidable, several additional feline guards then appeared from out of the fog as well, themselves dressed in armor and posing an additional challenge. While we hadn't come here to fight, and I didn't sense that the feline here were meaning to do us any serious harm, it did appear that combat was inevitable. Still not wanting to fight the powerful feline warriors, I instead attempted to negotiate, trying to convince the potential combatants to simply let us pass through. Talk? The feline champion asked, genuinely surprised. Words can be as strong as weapons. What do you have to say to us? Pleasantly surprised that the feline were actually interested in negotiation as well, I spent the next few moments trying to explain why it was in everyone's best interests to resist combat and even work together, for the betterment of all. Your words ring true, the massive feline acknowledged, apparently standing down. There are more ways than one to test your strength, you may pass. Our lord and king awaits through the door behind me. Moments later, the young feline Ziza reappeared again from the fog and cautiously took my hand, it appeared her trust for me and the adventuring party was growing, and I flashed her a warm smile as she led us eastward and toward another door in the far eastern wall. Continuing east, we entered what appeared to be a makeshift palace room, the area primitive and even gaudy. A stately feline sat on his wooden throne, surprisingly unprotected here yet apparently unafraid as we entered. As the feline sprang from his throne and approached, I quickly recognized him, he was Lord Rustinian, who we had met earlier up within the city's power tower. Our last encounter with him didn't end very well, with his lackeys hauling us away to the town jail. Now all but defenseless, I could have done just about anything I wished with him. Indeed, considering what this feline had just put all of us through the past few hours, my initial impulse was to retaliate in some way. Instead, I simply bowed slightly before the creature as a small token of respect, surprising Rustinian. In turn, the Lord bowed as well, a soft smile on his face. Many apologies, heroes. I had to know if I could trust you. Before I could respond, Rustinian stepped to Zissa and gave her a long, bone-crushing hug, the two feline clearly happy to see one another again. The embrace ended, and Rustinian asked if she was okay, Zissa nodding affirmatively. This is my granddaughter, Zissa, someone I would give my life for. I sincerely thank you for not harming her in the least. This young feline was both poised and brave in bringing us here, Sainayers responded, flattering Zissa somewhat. You should be proud of her. Yes, without a doubt, Rustinian responded, smiling. Now, you must have questions, where should we begin? Why are all the feline out of control above? Eswin demanded to know, not exactly the first question I wanted to ask. To answer that, let me start at the beginning, Rustinian responded, breathing a heavy sigh first. As I am sure you know, we feline weren't always humanoid like yourselves. Until a few decades ago, we were more like large, normal cats, we couldn't talk, we didn't walk on two legs and we weren't, troubled, by this higher level of thinking, what's the word? Sentience? 
Siddhartha answered correctly. Yes, we became sentient, the Lord responded, his brow a bit furled. For better or worse, we became truly aware of the world around us, and we began to think about greater things. It's better to be sentient than not, Red Fern suggested with a nod and a smile. We thought the same thing, at least at first. But the more we came to understand, the more we realized how, wrong, everything was. Ignorance can truly be bliss, and along with our ignorance we soon lost our innocence as well. Lord Rastinian sighed, looked away from our party and continued, beginning to grow angry. With our newfound sentience, we soon realized how unjust the world really was. For centuries, the humans here literally treated us like ordinary cats, buying and selling us as they wished, tearing us away from our families at such a young age, putting us to work in dangerous or unhealthy conditions, treating us like property. They had no right to treat us that way, even before we evolved into something more. These people never intended to hurt you, Sainayers suggested, perhaps assuming a little too much. Perhaps, Rastinian replied, becoming even angrier. But eventually every creature resents its cage, no matter how safe and protecting it is. Everything struggles to be free, especially once it becomes aware of the world around it. As we evolved, the humans who recognized our changing soon considered us a threat and they locked us all down here, afraid that we would one day rise to challenge or even replace them. For decades now, we've been trapped down here with little food and no sunlight, a miserable existence. Lord Rastinian turned back to all of us, his plea quite passionate. You've seen now how most of the feline down here survive, is that right? Is it just? Don't we deserve much better than this? It appeared that, for the feline here in Nace, the past few decades had been hell. In all my years within Mariga, I had never heard of anything so sad, so painful, so unjust as the feline being trapped and isolated in near total darkness for entire lifetimes because they were feared by a population of people who once loved them. The story was heartbreaking and I almost began to weep for them. Having really worked himself up now, Rastinian continued, almost accusing my adventuring party for all the injustice suffered these past few decades. You humans thought of us as mere playthings or servants, to do with as you wanted. But we have become more than what we were, perhaps even more than you humans. We think, we dream, we love, and we have suffered. How are we any different from you? Yet we remained enslaved, exiled, abandoned, forgotten. And now, it could get even worse. Worse? I asked, not sure I wanted to know where Rastinian was steering the conversation. A few years ago, the humans above apparently decided that enough was enough that it was time to deal with us once and for all. So they started providing us with more food, and soon we had all the food we could want. That does not sound so bad, Ariana commented, her innocence again apparent. At the time we didn't know it, but the food was poisoned, and it slowly drained away our sentience, causing us to revert to what we were decades ago. As more and more of us lost our sentience, the humans above took us back into their homes, their shops, their farms, treating us again as the mere large cats they wanted us to be all along. Humans seem to eventually wreck everything, I commented, ignoring the strange stares from Eswin and Sane ears. That has been our experience, Rastinian responded, surprised by the comment. So, many of us became ignorant again and returned to a world of bliss, escaping this underground tomb to run in the fields again under the sun and be happy. You've already witnessed this above within the city. That explains all the feline running amok above, Red Fern pondered, still not sure of what was truly going on. But why are the humans above acting in such a strange way as well? And why haven't the rest of you down here escaped? Once we finally discovered what the humans were doing, several of us faked a return to our primitive selves so we could learn more about the humans and try to find a way to end our ordeal. Eventually, my son and I befriended a human woman named Faria. The supreme healer priest of the Sislan Way here in Nace, Sainayers confirmed, encouraging Rastinian to continue. At first, Faria didn't know anything about us, that we had become sentient, only for most of us to lose that gift through the poison the humans were feeding us. Once she understood it all, however, she began to help us, using her magic to soon discover the specific poison the humans were using to revert us. You, humans, call it. Fear antidote. Not expecting anything to be said from Zissa, let alone something so profound, I was shocked by the comment. Could it be that the fear antidote, the very medicine created by the Sislan way to prevent the fear from driving afflicted humans mad was used to poison the feline as well? 
The Sislan Way would receive shipments of the antidote, then turn around and taint our food with it, causing us to revert to our primitive selves, Rustinian continued, still disgusted by it all. We assumed that Faria was behind it all, so we kidnapped her and brought her down here to answer for her crimes. You kidnapped the Supreme Healer Priest? Sainayers cried, shocked by the revelation. Please understand, what the humans did to us was far more horrific. And those of us who retained our sentience, especially my son Flavit, bore only hatred and revenge in their hearts. Daddy! Zissa cried out, recognizing the name. Yes, your father, my son, Flavit, Rustinian acknowledged, hanging his head low at the same time. What terrible thing has Flavit done? I asked, recognizing the conspiracy here. Shortly after kidnapping Faria, Flavit poured about half of the fear antidote into the human's water supply, poisoning them the same way they had poisoned us. It took several additional doses, but soon the humans began to lose their intellect just as we had. Some of us who were still sentient came above ground again and seized power here in Nace, allowing our poisoned brethren to do as they wish within the city. That was several months ago now. So that explains what happened above ground, Ariana commented, still a bit puzzled. But what about the feline down here? They seem so sad, so desperate. They still retain their sentience, Rustinian responded, saddened for them as well. But they're too afraid to return to the surface. So, let me see if I understand all of this, Eswin began, the fighter choosing to exercise his own intelligence. The humans treated you feline poorly, you found a way to rebel, and now the city is in complete turmoil with really nobody in charge? Daddy! Zissa cried out again, suggesting that Rustinian's son Flavit was the only one with any real power now. So we know what's going on now, Redfern continued. What's the next step? We've used the last of the Sislan fear antidote, so the humans will slowly start returning to normal. And when they do, they're not going to be too happy with what you did to them, Sainayers interjected, finishing Rustinian's sentence. It's going to get ugly, perhaps even violent. We know, Rustinian responded, quite concerned. The feline, too, who were poisoned and lost their sentience, the poison was temporary as well and they're already regaining what was lost. Soon, my brethren will realize the truth and will also want their revenge. With both sides so angry and seeking revenge, the conflict between the humans here and the feline will likely result in civil war, Kartha summarized. There will be a lot of death. I've come to the same conclusion, the feline lord agreed, very worried. The situation is now so out of control. I have no idea what to do. Heroes, help us. Zissa innocently said, both a comment as well as request. Lord Rustinian nodded his head a few times in agreement, looking to me to come up with a plan. Yes, we need to find a way to bring both sides together, I began, summarizing our goals together. We must find a way in which the humans can atone for the terrible things they've done, the feline can apologize for what has happened recently and both sides can reach an amicable and peaceful understanding. I think I know a way that could work, Lord Rustinian offered, to my surprise. You'll need to rescue the Supreme Healer Priest Faria from my son, who has her captive in the caves south of here. Faria is a rare voice of reason within Nace as well as the daughter of Lord Mason, rescue her, and she might be able to figure out a solution that works for the betterment of all. That sounds easy enough, Eswin suggested. But your son, this Flavit feline, how do we deal with him? Not only was the question relevant, but Flavit's own daughter Zissa was standing right there, suddenly afraid for her own father as she turned to me for a response. Have no fear, Zissa, I responded, my smile sincere as well as spirited. Well be sure to show that we're on your father's side too when we rescue the cleric, we won't try to hurt him. Zissa smiled and hugged me, the moment a bit awkward but tender nonetheless. Lord Rustinian then provided some much needed logistical information. You'll find Faria locked away somewhere to the south. My son and his followers now occupy ruins even older than these, so be careful, the ruins were built by some evil human necromancers centuries ago and are dangerous. You should also find a stairway that leads up into the Sislan temple here in Nace, once you have Faria, return her there so we can then figure out what we should do next. Well meet you there. I looked to my fellow heroes for advice, their determined nods confirming we were all in agreement to try and rescue Faria. Well be on our way, then, the feline lord said, turning to leave. I will restore Lord Mason and his human guards back to their senses, then wait for you up in the Sislan temple, find Faria as soon as you can and meet us up there. 
And please, don't kill my son Flavit, he will be quite the handful, but he does not deserve to die. Rastinian bowed again, then led his granddaughter Zissa away and through the western door, out of sight moments later. The plan was clear, go and rescue the cleric Faria, find our way back up to the Sislan temple and do our best to find some common ground between the humans here in Nace and the Feline to stop a full civil war. We spent an hour or so magically healing ourselves and taking a short rest, then departed the makeshift palace room via the wooden door to the south. Passing through the door, we stepped into a long stone hallway, at least 100 feet long leading away due south. In addition to the door we stood within, there was another door immediately to the west. A few additional doors were visible perhaps 50 feet away to the south. Standing there and carefully studying the stonework for a few moments, it appeared that the ruins here were not part of the feline living areas to the north we had already passed through. Rather, this area seemed older, more sinister, and more dangerous. These poor feline, Ariana began, the words of Rastinian stuck in her mind. How can we help them? I am not sure, Redfern answered, his mind also racing regarding the bigger picture. I don't see a way of helping the humans and the feline find any common ground. Hopefully this feria will have some answers, Eswin commented, growing impatient. Let's go find her and put this whole situation behind us. My heroes all agreed and I gave Eswin the affirmative nod to try the western door and see where that would take us. Opening the door, we found a rather large barracks full of broken down beds, a few rotting chests and a sorry collection of dressers, footlockers, and weapon racks. Several candles also lit the area fairly well. Lying atop the beds were a bunch of feline, half a dozen or so altogether. Poorly dressed and physically exhausted, they began to hiss as we entered the room, showing their teeth as if about to attack. Quickly recognizing that the feline here were hungry, worn out and in terrible spirits, I was able to convince them not to attack, indicating that we were here on behalf of Lord Rastinian. Perhaps more curious than threatened now, the feline all rose to their feet and almost surrounded us, they didn't see too many visitors, especially ones who had been sent by Rastinian. As they neared the party, I couldn't tell if they would maintain a safe distance or reach out and start taking whatever they could from us, the situation sat and awkward. Can any of you tell us the whereabouts of this Islan cleric Feria? Sainayers asked, unafraid. At first none of the feline responded, looking at one another and then turning away, I was pretty sure they knew but it appeared they didn't want to tell us. Flavit would have our heads if we told you, one of the braver feline finally admitted, breaking the awkward silence. You should leave. What if we made it worth your while? Redfern suggested, holding some gold coins in his fingers. Ten gold pieces for each of you? The eight feline here were suddenly intrigued, they had likely never seen a single gold coin before, so ten of them for each soldier would be quite the prize. Incredulous, the feline reached out and accepted the bribe, each of them staring at the coins as if they had never held such wealth before. We not expect such help from, humans, one of the feline acknowledged, surprised. Cleric being held in cell beyond Flavit's bed chambers to the southeast. But you not hear that from us. Thank you, Ariana responded, her smile alone passing along our party's gratitude. And with that, the feline went back to what they were doing, much better off than they were before our arrival. Taking the southern exit from the feline barracks, we soon entered an underground pit toilet, the burning stench of urine assaulting our noses like a strong acid. Indeed, it was all we could do to hold down our last meal as we looked around here. Naturally, we didn't want to get too close to the open pit here used by the feline to relieve themselves as needed. I sensed that if we immediately left the area, through the door to the south we would be okay. If, however, we wanted to remain here to search the area, the disgusting chamber could make us very sick. It was a chance I was willing to take, so I instructed my heroes to remain in the chamber and give it a good search. Equally surprised and disappointed with my request to search the latrine, my party heroes reluctantly agreed, spreading out to look for anything of interest or value. After about 20 minutes of searching, however, we didn't find anything. Worse, the stench here was so awful that several of us became sick to our stomachs, Sainayers actually vomiting from the terrible stench. Feeling rather bad for my heroes and now convinced that there was nothing here to find anyway, we escaped through the door to the south and quickly fled the feline litter box. Passing through the door from the litter box to the north, we entered what appeared to be a master bedroom, home to just one or two high-ranking feline and consisting of a well-constructed bed, dresser, desk, and wash basin. 
Doing a quick search of the bedchamber, it didn't appear to be used all that often, at least not recently. Whoever used it, however, must have been of particular title or status, I hadn't seen anything this expensive or elegant anywhere down here in the feline underground so far. By some of the markings on the furniture, a few of the personal items left on the desk and a few other clues and tidbits, we were reasonably sure that the bedroom belonged to Lord Rustinian himself, and that we probably didn't want to spend much time here rummaging through his personal property. Moments later, Ariana requested that everyone become still for a moment, as she thought she heard something. The elf then cocked her head and pointed toward the bed, a faint, muffled sound was coming from it, likely underneath. While we didn't find anything unusual with the bed itself, underneath the bed we found a rather large wooden footlocker. Strangely enough, there appeared to be several dozen tiny holes bored into the footlocker in seemingly random places. However, the footlocker itself wasn't locked, so it was easily opened if we wanted. I don't think Rustinian would want us disturbing his personal things, Kartha commented. We should put that back where we found it. Curiosity getting the better of me again, and against Kartha's advice, I decided to open the footlocker anyway. Immediately, several mammalian creatures jumped out at us, attacking the party with such speed and hostility that we were put on the defensive. The wild ferrets bit several of us and even drained a bit of our blood before we were able to knock them unconscious. We then breathed a sigh of relief, glad we were able to defeat such quick and bloodthirsty creatures. I told you we should have left the footlocker alone. Kartha complained quite disappointed in me. Next time, you should respect other people's property. That's actually clever, protecting one's wealth with such dangerous creatures, S. Wynn acknowledged, somewhat impressed. There did appear to be some treasure within the footlocker, ours for the taking if we really felt the need to steal from Lord Rustinian. Having second thoughts about the whole thing, I wisely decided to leave the treasure alone, something that clearly didn't belong to us. Closing the footlocker back up, I already had some explaining to do when we saw Rastinian next time, at least I wouldn't have to admit that we had stolen from him too. Taking a door from Rastinian's bedchamber to the east and passing through the long hallway we had seen before, we entered another well-furnished bedroom with a pair of beds, some cabinets, dressers, and a crude wash basin. The area around one of the beds seemed a bit colorful, out of place within this otherwise dungeon-like chamber. In addition to the door we had just used to enter the room from the west, another door beckoned our curiosity to the north. This room looks a lot like Rustinian's bedchamber to the west, Ariana commented. The furniture looks the same and likely came from the same source. I am guessing it belongs to Rustinian's son, Flavit, Redfern conjectured. There is even a bed here for his daughter Zissa. But it does not look like they've been here for a while. Doing a quick search of the chamber, lying in the far northeastern corner was what appeared to be a small book or journal. S. Wynn walked over and picked the journal up as the rest of us congregated near the northern door. Taking possession of the journal, a quick review revealed it to be some sort of personal diary, likely dropped here recently and lost until now. An important clue, I spent the next hour or so going through the diary in the hopes of learning something important. Most of the journal was filled with general observations and notes of a cleric's day-to-day -day interactions with the people of Nace, mundane details that were uninteresting. But the last few entries were certainly intriguing, Rustinian and Flavit contacting Feria, the cleric agreeing to try and help them, the people of Nace starting to behave like the feline, and how, at the end, she began to fear that Flavit himself was up to no good. The notes confirmed Rustinian's story earlier and indeed indicted Flavit as the instigator of all that had happened within Nace recently. Indeed, I sensed that Feria really wanted to help the feline and trusted Flavit as well as Rustinian, so clearly Flavit betrayed that trust in kidnapping her and bringing her down here. Hence, I recognized that I shouldn't trust Flavit as she did. The bedchamber searched, there was little more to do here and so we turned toward the door in the northern wall. The chamber here was another guard room, large enough to sleep perhaps a dozen guards. Typical and ordinary, the bunk beds, cabinets, and minimal furnishings were both dirty and damaged, barely adequate for the feline who lived here. Before we entered the room, we noticed a few sleepy feline standing near the far eastern wall, not paying attention. Who's that? One of the feline suddenly asked, snapping out of his stupor and readying his weapon. For a moment, the two feline looked terrified as we made our presence known. Immediately recognizing that they were surrounded by a powerful adventuring party, the two agreed to talk. Asking for the whereabouts of the cleric Feria, the two feline initially looked away, not wanting to answer my question. 
They then stared strangely at the eastern wall, was something there? Recognizing that we weren't going to get any further information from the feline, I agreed to let them go, the creatures dashing for the open door to the south and gone moments later. Doing a quick search of the guard room, it didn't take much to find the secret door in the eastern wall, the exit opening easily. Had we found the cleric feria perhaps? Passing through the secret door, the hidden chamber beyond was tiny, barely ten feet to a side, and the air was cold and stagnant, a miserable place to dwell. Crude stone shackles hung from each wall, while several buckets containing bodily wastes reeked in the far corner. Clearly, the cell was recently used to imprison someone. While there was nothing more to find, Ariana sniffed the air, recognizing something. I smell, fragrance, a woman's perfume. Feria. Sane Ears exclaimed. She's been here. So it seems we're too late, S. Wynn responded, a bit discouraged. Now what? She must be somewhere. Ariana added, determined. Well need to backtrack. All in agreement, we quickly headed back to the long hallway leading north to south and turned left, soon reaching its southernmost door. What immediately commanded our attention here was the feline soldier lying face down in a pool of his own blood, a dagger protruding from his back. Both Sainaeus and Kartha bent down beside the mortally wounded creature to determine his condition. Quick, Sislan, we can still save him. Kartha demanded, reaching out to Sainaeus. Take my hand, our combined power will be stronger. For a moment, Sainaeus stared dumbfounded at Kartha, shocked that she would again suggest working together. Just this once, Mutin, Sainaeus finally whispered, angry but willing to lend his power to her. Kartha grabbed the hand of Sane Ears and the two invoked the power of their respective faiths, staunching the flow of blood from the backstabbed feline and certainly saving his life. Eswin reached down and extracted the dagger from the soldier's back, the blood no longer flowing freely. The feline regained consciousness, rolled over on his back and opened his eyes, looking at all of us, quite confused. Why, why do you try to kill me? Easy, friend, Ariana commanded her reassuring eyes doing most of the communication. That blade in your back was the work of someone else. Yes, yes, the feline stuttered, slowly recalling what had just happened to him. Flavit led the cleric to be sacrificed. I disagreed, we shout, then he attacked me from behind. Sacrificed? Redfern exclaimed, quite surprised. Tell us more. Flavit no longer trust own father, Restinian. Flave it to sacrifice cleric to old feline shadow gods and bring ruin to humans above. The feline then passed out again, likely needing days now to slowly recover and heal. Sacrifice to, feline shadow gods? Eswin queried, confused. Just when I thought this couldn't get any stranger. Like all sentient creatures, the feline at some point adopted a religion to explain their existence, Kartha instructed, trying not to insult Sainayers at the same time for his beliefs. Not sure what these shadow gods are but I doubt they pose any real threat. Either way, we better head south now if we want to rescue the cleric in time. Eswin commanded, ready to lead the party forward. Let's go. Laying the unconscious feline aside, we turned toward the southern door, itself slightly ajar, we were likely just a few minutes behind Flavit and his wicked plans to sacrifice Feria. And that's a wrap of episode number 17, Race to Save Feria. Expect additional episodes every few weeks as the story continues.